Would you open your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter five. I'm in a series called Grace, the Source of Life. This is part two. If you're watching online, not live, but delayed, stop watching this message right now. Go back to last week and make sure you watch part one. If you are here in the room or watching live and you haven't seen part one, I highly encourage you to get home sometime this week, watch part one, then watch part two again. Today I am going to give you, I, I'm, I'm calling part two the key to answered prayer. I'm gonna tell you how to pray. I'm gonna tell you how to get your, your prayers answered. I could have called it how to guarantee never to get an answer to prayer or how to fail at prayer. But I decided to do it in a positive note instead of a negative note. Instead of how to fail at prayer, I thought I would just talk to you about how to succeed at prayer. If you will listen closely, in fact, you don't even have to listen that closely, this message will change your life forever. I'm about to share things with you that if you put to use and put to practice, your life, your prayer life will be different from this day forward until you go to heaven. But before we do, I wanna talk to you about a a small program called BOLD. BOLD is a video discipleship program that we've created that has hours of Bible teaching. And it's absolutely free for you as a student. You can go on our website on the homepage and scroll down to the bottom and you'll find this, this section of the homepage and you can click on BOLD and you can start a discipleship program and it's systematic, for, gets you through multiple videos with multiple teachers. Wanted you to know that. Okay, I told you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter five, correct? But I'm, I want you there. I'm gonna go back of what our verse is. We are, I'm teaching the book of 1 Corinthians and we are in chapter 15. And we have landed on a verse that we're gonna be there for a while and that's verse 10. It says this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this is Paul talking about him being an apostle, him being saved, him being delivered. He used to persecute the church, but now he's an apostle of the church. He goes, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And so what I want you to understand and grasp is Paul is saying he exists in his life as an apostle on the grace of God. And it's also the grace of God that gives him the ability to labor. I believe if you are a grace person, you are more serious about your relationship with Jesus than anyone else. If you are truly a grace person, you are laboring more than the average Christian. You are not a carnal Christian, you are a dedicated disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what grace people are. Grace people are not lazy, they're not, uh, uh, they, they are passionate about following Jesus. Grace will cause you to understand how much God loves you and the love of God will bring you to repentance. And the more that you are realizing how much the Lord loves you, the more you are saying, thank you for my salvation. What can I do for you? Grace turns you into a servant, not a slave. Grace turns you into someone who's laboring and someone who is appreciative of what God has done. True grace. Now, if you're gonna get into some other things that are not true grace, then you need to back up and follow the Bible when it comes to it. This is the scripture that we are landed on, and I'll be here for a while, and I'm gonna talk to you about grace, and we're doing a deep dive in grace. Here's where I left you off last week in Romans chapter five, and this is where I asked you to go. It says in Romans chapter five, you know, remember the word therefore? You know, the word therefore and moreover, I make a big deal about it because it is not the beginning of a statement. It's not. You know, uh, I I shared this story before, but one time Suzette and I were on a road trip and we're driving on the road trip. We were in the central part of California on I-5 coming towards, you know, the LA area and no one had talked in that car for two hours. There was no conversation for two hours. And all of a sudden, I am driving, and she goes, and furthermore. I said, what? She had an entire conversation in her head with me responding, a very woman thing. 
And she jumped into the conversation without filling me in where we were. And here's what I'm saying is, furthermore isn't the way you start a conversation. Therefore is not the way you start a conversation. Paul is indicating, I am now going to share a spiritual truth with you based off of information I just gave you. Based off information before the therefore is why I'm able to say what I'm about to say after the therefore. And so Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith. We're going to go back before the therefore in just a moment. But Paul says this. He goes, having been justified, which is past tense, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, also, okay, so here's what it says. We have peace with God and also peace with God and also we have Access, do you know what the word access means, right? It means to get into something. You have freedom to, to enter. We have access by faith into this grace, which is a different grace than the peace grace. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And the word for stand has to do with our lifestyle. The life that you are living, the life that God wants you to live, he has graced you to live it. He wants you to use his grace to live it, and now we're going to show you how that all works, in which we stand. And we, we need to be rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. So this is going to be, I'll talk about this for a couple of weeks, and come back to this again as we go into chapter 4. So now we're headed into chapter 4, verse 13, and we jump into a story. In chapter four, Paul, writing to the Romans, he's talking about Abraham. I want you to realize that Abraham lived between five and 600 years before Moses received the law from God. Abraham is way before the law. Do you have that? 500 years is a lot of time, isn't it? In our shortness of planet Earth. And so he's talking about Abraham. And he says in verse 13, so we are jumping into the middle of a thought, but it will all make sense. He goes, for the promise, okay, for the promise that he would be heir of the world. So God promised Abraham, you'll own the whole world. It's a promise to Abraham. Before, he says the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. Righteousness, the word righteousness, and we'll get into it in just a couple more minutes. Righteousness has to do with a right relationship with God. And God tells Abraham that you are going to be right with me. We are going to have a relationship based off of you believing what I tell you. So this is how it starts. Everything starts with Abraham. All faith is from Abraham and looks to Abraham as our example. The law always is a type of something we do, which is works, and that's the law. He goes, it's not gonna be through the law. You are not going to behave in a way that makes you approved to have a relationship with me. You are going to believe what I say, and that approves you to in a relationship with me. The behavior is going to come out of the relationship. The relationship doesn't come out of the behavior. If we are grace people, our behavior should change from the world's behavior because we have the grace of God inside us to give us the ability to be different than everyone else. Very important. So the law always is a type of something that we do, which is works, but grace is always something that God does, which is for our benefit. Verse 14, for those who are of the law are heirs, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. This is really important. And the promise is made of no effect. If you could get God's a relationship with God by behavior, then there's no reason for faith. You don't need faith. You need behavior. And Paul is telling us that if those who are of the law, who are behaving the law, are heirs, if their heirship, if their, if, if their blessings, their future 
uh, prosperity, their future relationship with God is based off of what they do right now, then why do we have a promise? What do we have faith for? We don't need faith. Then he says, here's what I would like you to get. If we can receive a prayer answered by our works, there is no need to have a promise. All promises of God are personal commitments of God responding to faith. It's going to make sense in in just a couple of moments. Verse 15. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. So Paul indicates if you have a law and you break the law, then there's wrath. the, The law always needs something to back it up. Now, if you go... Uh, you can get a ticket for driving too fast. Did you know you can also get a ticket for driving too slow? I have so many pet peeves when it comes to driving. (laughs) The biggest one for Californians, why don't you use a turn signal? What's wrong with turn signals? Why do people just move lane to lane without telling you? Anyway, and the other thing is, why are you in the carpool lane going slower than the other three lanes next to you? Get out of the carpool lane. If, if there's space between you and the other car, it should be occupied. Anyway, if you, okay, there are times on the 55 freeway going south You cannot go faster than 35. There are times. But there are times of the day that if you go less than 80, you are going to get run over. And so you you flow with the traffic. You go with it. You you flow. Sometimes it's 82, you know, in, in a 65. But you could get a ticket for going too fast. Why? Because the law says this then there's punishment for the law. Paul is saying, he goes, because the law brings about wrath, punishment. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law always requires a punishment. If there is no law in the equation, then there is no need for punishment. And what God wants to do through faith is deliver you from punishment by faith because of the grace of God, and he wants a relationship with you by grace so you avoid punishment. Then you're saying right now, well, does that mean there's no consequence to uh, if I get born again and I sin, there's no consequence? No, that's being idiotic or misinformed. (laughs) Which way should I deliver it? Um, Okay, grace is God, listen to this. Grace is God making a promise to you He is giving his word and it will not return to him void. Grace requires a promise. Faith requires grace. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. The hope is the promise of God. In the promise of God is the power of God to bring the prayer to pass not you in your behavior. Your behavior is not what powers God to bless you and answer your prayer. It's God's promise that it will happen and come to pass. In verse 16, it says this, therefore, because of the stuff he just said about faith and about grace, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. All the seed is referring to every human being on planet Earth. There is a promise to every human being on planet Earth, and that is, call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. So someone calls on the name of the Lord. What is the actual power that saves them? It is in the word of God when he said, call on the name, you shall be saved. Do you remember in the book of Genesis it said, God said, let there be light, and there was light? God's words are full of life 
and full of power. Every promise in the Bible has its own ability to come to pass in your life when you mix faith with the promise, not mix faith with your behavior. What hinders our prayers more than anything else is we disqualify ourselves because we make a mistake or we sin or we've done something wrong or we, we're not sure if God really cares about us or we're not sure that God loves us or we think that God forgot about us. And then we void out the promise's power to come to pass because we're not believing. So it says here, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Why does the promise have to be sure to everybody? Because whatever the promise is, it has the ability to bring itself to pass. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now he gets into Abraham. As it is written, as it is written, as it is written, what is written is a quote from God. This is a quote from God's lips. I have made you a father of many nations. Well, did you know Abraham is a father of many nations? Well, he had a bunch of kids. You know, he didn't have just two kids. You know, he had, if you read the Bible, you'll find out he had quite a few children. He had children all the way up to his, like he was 145. So he was having a bunch of kids. And it's not that every child became a nation. It's referring to the spiritual nations. Of every tribe, of every tongue, of every nationality, there is a believer in Jesus Christ on planet Earth right now. There are people who believe all over this world. And they look different. They have different skin. They have different looks. They have different color of skin. They are male. They are female. There are believers that cover the globe. They are part of the many nations. And it says this, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God says something and says it as it is existing before it exists. God clearly communicates the existence of something before it exists. There was no light. God said, let there be light. And what was made from that? Solar systems? Light? Power? What, what did that phrase, let there be light, do? Do you want to know a phrase that's even more powerful than that? Call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. In that phrase, which was given by the word of God, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The plan of God was that accept Jesus Christ. In the word of God that is out here, it never ever ends in power. It doesn't need wind, it doesn't need solar, it doesn't need petroleum. It is the power of God to deliver. And it won't run out of power. Why? It's based off of grace. It's based off of grace. He says he calls those things that are not as though they did. Did you know God has called your body healed when it's not? God has called your finances and your bills to be paid before they are. Did you know God has called you to your future before you get there? You know that he has given his word to you. There are promises after promise after promise after promise in the Bible that are available to you. And the promises have the power within themselves to bring themselves to pass if somebody will access this grace in which we stand by faith. And how does that faith work? Abraham is our example. Who contrary to hope, this is Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. I love this phrase. Contrary to hope, human hope, in hope, godly hope, believed. He looks at the situation. Abraham looked at the situation and he said, hmm, not looking good. But he said it. And that's the hope. In hope, we believe. This is what our faith needs to give substance to. 
The faith is the substance of things hoped for, which simply means God has promised something that produces the hope, that produces the vision, that produces the insight, that produces what we, we need to see life different. That is the answer for our situation. And then when that takes place, when that takes place, we mix faith with it and we believe and the power of God will bring it to pass. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Here's what was spoken. He became, look at this, look at this is, gosh, let me, where are you? Come back. He goes, I, I want you to see this. Who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father. He became, present tense, came to pass. He became the father of many nations according to, which means here's how it happened, what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. God said, so shall your descendants be. And that was the power to change Abraham from a dead body and Sarah from a dead body to have a child. Look at we're going to come back to verse 18. Let's jump over to Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God, the word of God, and this is the spoken word of God. It could be the written word of God after he spoke it. It could be quoting God. It could be the word of God. It is the Bible, the word of God. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And a lot of you know this Bible verse very, very much, but what I wanted to get more than anything else is this phrase, living and powerful. The word powerful means effective in causing something to happen. You need to realize that the word of God itself, within itself, has power. It has power to change the situation. It has power in it to heal your body. It is the promise of God. When God says, by his stripes you are healed, the question isn't, does God want me to be healed? The question is, will you trust God in what he said? This is where it gets complicated. Not for God at all and not for the system. Because really what I'm sharing with you and I'm, as it unfolds today is the key to answer prayer. All prayer works this way. Prayer for yourself. Now there's other types of prayer. Intercessory prayer, prayer petition, prayer of supplication. There's different types of prayer. But the basic foundation of prayer all works 100% of the time based off of what I'm going to introduce to you right now. All of it does. There are no exceptions. You do not earn answered prayer. You receive it. You don't earn it. There's a big, big difference. What happens in your head is a big difference too. Back to verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that be, he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. He became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. And then what we have is your faith, your faith needs to be in the ability of God to perform what he promised. Our faith in God is, do we believe he's big enough to do what he said he would do? Do we believe he promised it? Do we believe that he keeps his word? He's bound to his word. We put, we put our faith in what he has said. Now, not in your ability to perform or stay out of sin until the prayer is answered. Here's where it messes up. So many people will ask God for something. They'll pray, and then they don't have a good day. They may have messed up. And they immediately, in their own mind, maybe not out loud, but emotionally inside, they disconnect from the right to have that prayer answered. Because I'm not good enough. You weren't good enough when you first prayed it. You approaching God with your trophy of good behavior for 12 days. Now I've been really good. I've been a Christian. I even tithed last week. That should qualify me to be prayed for. I was a young pastor. I'd only been pastoring about a year and a half, and I did a house call. And um, the house call I was at is um, I was visiting these people. They asked me to come. They asked me to come pray for this guy. This guy I had never seen in our church. I'd seen his wife in our church, and he was in his lazy boy, kicked back on the 
chairs, you know, when I came into his house, he didn't even stand up and shake my hand. He just started getting mad at me. Found the guy's high on cocaine, and he wants to know how come he did what that preacher on TV said. He goes, I gave 10% to that guy on TV, and I'm supposed to get a hundredfold back. Where's my money? In your veins. And God is not a genie where you manipulate. He is our Savior. His Son is our Lord. He is the Father and Creator of all things. And we work His system. He doesn't work our system. We don't create the system that He has to behave by. We behave by the system he created. And there's a big difference in that. But here's the thing. It's not in your ability to keep being good while you're waiting for the prayer to get answered. It's in your ability to believe the promise is still true. The fact that you are looking to God means you are in faith. If you're looking to him, you are in faith. Follow this one. This is to help some of you. If you are truly in faith, if you're looking to God, seeking his face, seeking first the kingdom, and you are sinning, and if you sin or do sin, or your actions are contrary to God's plan, the Holy Spirit will point this out to you and ask you to repent in the process. If you're hearing, if you're seeking God, you're going to hear his voice, and and the the voice of God is going to say, no, 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 don't, don't don't do that. Don't behave like that. Don't talk like that. Don't think like that. You're going to hear those things. You need to stay in faith. You need to believe that God is their deliverer. And you, as you grow in the Lord and make mistakes, the Holy Spirit will move you to different, different processes. I don't know how many times that I've had the Holy Spirit in the middle of something say, you know what, I really don't like that about you. So, oh, okay, go to change that. And it's usually um, in a difficult situation where you, I'll call it fleshed out. Have you ever been caught off guard with maybe not as much sleep as you need to, maybe some pressure at work, maybe some other things happen and you blew your top? Has that ever happened? Only to seven of you? And then does that automatically, boom, God goes, forget it. You're not good enough. You're, I'm not going to answer that prayer. Does it stop God from delivering you? No. But the Holy Spirit will speak up and he will ask you to, at that moment and moments to come, repent, which simply means stop doing that way, do it my way. Quit doing it your way, do it my way. That's what repentance is. You need to behave in the following and leading of the Holy Spirit and know that you will stumble. The righteous will fall seven times and still get up all in the day, all in an hour. Some of you have fallen seven times listening to this message. (laughs) Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, this is big deal, not being weak in faith, He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was past the age of ability of having child. Her womb was closed down and Abraham wasn't producing sperm. He was old, dried up. And God, he he looks at that and he he goes, you're an old woman, I'm an old man. God wants us to have kids. Let's give it a try. And so what happens is, he goes, he did not, he wasn't being weak in faith. Abraham did not come to God and ask for something, but God came to him. Abraham isn't the one that said, hey, I want to have a child. God is the one that says, I want you to have a child. And in the words, you shall be the father of many nations, started to regenerate his body and her body. And in that regeneration, they're able to have a child. From the time that God spoke it to Abraham to the time that their son was born was almost 10 years. Some of you get upset because you wait 10 minutes. 
10 years, holding on the promise. During that 10 year time period, their bodies are changing. They're actually getting younger. During that 10 year process, life's coming back into Abraham. Life's coming back into Sarah. But they don't want to wait all that time. They think something's wrong. And then they manipulate the plan. And when they manipulate the plan, they decide, uh, okay, take my handmaiden, take my, my servant, and have a child with, with her. And Abraham goes, sure, fine, let's do it. <laughs> Could say a lot about that, but... <laughs> but look what happens. is in Abraham and Sarah both sinned. They flat out sinned. They flat out went against the plan of God. What did God do? He corrected them, but he held them to the plan. They repented and they stuck with the plan. And then eventually the plan of God came to pass. What I'm trying to share with you is your mistake won't disqualify you if you keep following after God. What you will get disqualified for is when you stop believing the promise and God's ability. But I'm gonna tell you right now, if you are believing in the promises of God, your heart will go after God. And if you see some things in your life that, just not God's plan, God's way, your heart's gonna say, help me do this. I mean, you're in a great place. There's nothing better than holding on to a promise of God and believing that God is gonna bring that promise to pass and then the Holy Spirit regenerating you like he did Abraham and Sarah. Nothing wrong with that at all. Verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. The word waver, the Greek word for waver means to have a disagreement over something, to pause or hold back in uncertainty or unwillingness. So he did not waver, he didn't argue with God. He didn't tell God, I don't see how that can happen. And we do that all the time with ourselves. We argue with ourselves why God can't bring that delivering into our life. There was a young man who died of cancer uh, in this church. He was a member of the church. I'd known him for a long time. I was working with him. I visited him at the hospital multiple times. But when he had cancer, he got online and researched cancer. He researched his cancer. And every time I talked to him about the promise of God, let's not waver at the promise of God, he argued why his case was different. He would argue and justify, well, have you ever heard of anyone that has this kind of cancer being healed? What difference does that make? How's that change the promise? He research for hours, and he was a very intelligent man, very intelligent, he had an amazing brain. And he'd gather that information, he'd collect that information. So I talked to his wife, I said, well, how much is he reading the Bible? And she said, I never see him pick his Bible up. And he died of cancer. The battle, the cancer beat him because he was beating God's promises with an argument over and over over and over. It's a miserable way to go. So, well, pastor, I know someone who believed God and they still died. That's a good way to go. Believing God? Not believing God, but you're still both going? Which way do you want to go? I'm not trying to sound morbid or anything, but I would rather be holding on to the promises of God going into heaven at the same time. I don't know, just... I don't want to let go. I'm not going to let go of God, so let's continue. And being fully convinced that he had, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. All prayer, all prayer is based off a promise. Do you know how many people, I have prayed for thousands and thousands of people in the last 47 years, thousands of people. And the majority of the people that I ask the question, what promise are you holding on to 80% of the people say, well, I'm just praying. Okay, 
It is the promise that has the power of God that brings it to pass in your life. So what gives you the right to pray? What gives you the right to pray, the authority to pray, is God said it. If God says it, then that is the promise. That is a word from the Lord. It is light be and light was. It is if I can find where God has declared it, where I see in the Bible that by his stripes I am healed, when I see in the Bible that he carried my infirmities and my sicknesses, when I see that in the Bible and I hold on to that, that is the power that will change my body and my life. That is the power that will kill cancer. That is the power that will heal tuberculosis. That is the power that will crush out COVID. That is the power of God that will take care of your body. And that very power, now listen, 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 listen. If you're doing something that you're not aware of that's leading to your physical ailment and you hold on to the promise of God, eventually while you hold on to the promise of God, you will hear a voice of the Holy Spirit in some form, in some way of what change you need to have that is preventing your body from receiving it because of what you are doing. Do you need an example? Or is that simple? If you are having something in your diet that your body can't handle and it has resulted into you having some digestive issues or other issues in your body and you go to God and you pray by his stripes I am healed and every time you turn around you're seeing an article about this particular supplement or particular diet or particular food type or particular type of person and you find out that gosh that's me then you should stop eating that thing. That would be the Holy Spirit leading you into your healing versus just instantly being healed and continued to do what it's been doing. If you put your hand on the counter and you took a hammer and you started hitting your hammer and then you ask for prayer for your hand, it's not gonna do any good until you stop. Okay. And he was being fully convinced that what God had said What God had promised, he was able also to perform. The word, the Greek word for fully convinced means to be completely certain of the truth of something to be absolutely sure. I am not absolutely sure that I have the ability and power to to heal cancer. I'm absolutely sure that God does. And what I need you to know when it comes to prayer, number one, what promise are you using? Number two, are you convinced that God's word, God himself backs up that promise and that's what holds it to you? You need to know that you are gonna succeed in prayer because you trust the promise. You trust the one who said the promise. You are trusting what God is declaring, verse 22. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. The word righteousness means conforming to divine law, virtuous, holy, righteous. And it says here that God counted Abraham righteous, conforming to him, being in a relationship with him because of faith. Not because of behavior, but because of faith. And then we get to verse 23. Now it, was, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. But also for us it was imputed to him. But also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. The resurrection is the guarantee that promises work. We look to the resurrection of Jesus. God said he would raise him from the dead in three days. Jesus even said, he goes, go ahead, uh, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. The words themselves have the power. Why? Because God is the one that is full of life, full of power. And it is all by grace. Every single, every promise in the Bible is a choice of God saying it with his mouth, his grace. 
now if I can find a promise that pertains to my marriage, pertains to my finances, pertains to my health, pertains to my children, pertains to my grandchildren, pertains to my fourth generation, if I can find promises in the Bible that pertain to me, those are promises that were made way before I was born. So the equation is, do I believe the God who said it and do I believe he'll bring it to pass? Then the prayer will be answered. But it says, but also for us, because he raised the Lord from the dead, who was delivered us, who has delivered, uh, delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. He was delivered over to the cross because of our offenses. He was raised from the dead be- to justify us, to give us righteousness, so the promise can be sure. So the promises will be uh, there all the time. Here's a guide, because I have to close. Because somebody came up. <laughs> Here's a guide to successful prayer. All right? You could write this down. You could take a picture. But I want to tell you how to succeed in prayer. You can go into our phone app and get my notes of today. First thing that you need to do is seek first the kingdom of God. You want to have a successful prayer life. Make the kingdom of God important. Make it important. Seek first the kingdom of God. The next thing that you can do is examine, examine why you are praying. What do I mean by that? Here's what James says. James 4.3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And this word for amiss means evil, wicked. You're asking something just for you, not for the kingdom. You're asking just because you have lust. You're asking for greed. So you need to examine why are you praying? The next one. Ask for results, not a yes. That's what I mean. We tell God all the time how he should deliver us, how he should answer our prayer. We tell him all the time to, here's here's the situation I'm in, here's what you need to do. Instead of asking for, yes, Tom, why don't we ask for, God, here's the situation I'm in. What are you you going to do that I could cooperate with? Let's pray for results. Let's pray for end game. Let's pray for not how to do it. I don't know how many people have actually come up to me and, and said this. Listen to this prayer request. Would you pray that God heals me because I don't want to go through surgery? Here's what you're really saying. I want God to do it my way, not his way. I want him to prove that he really cares about me. I want to get healed right now because I don't want to uh, do the deductible for my health insurance. I don't want to miss any work. I don't want to be in the hospital. Those are all good reasons, but we shouldn't tell God how to do it. We should have an end result. You're facing some issue, let's believe God. Also, don't tell God it has to be surgery. Because some of you do that. Some of you have so much faith in the medical world that God can't heal you any other way because you don't believe it. You don't believe the promises. And you have to let God. Ask for results, not for yes. Ask for God's way, not yours. Not your way. Let God Say, how do you want to do this instead of do it this way? And then I have this. This is important. I wish it wasn't on the bottom. Pause, promise, pray. Write it down. Pause, promise, pray. People pray too fast. They pray way too quick. Something goes on, bang, let's pray right now. Do you have a promise for that prayer? Pause, contemplate the situation. Breathe, take a moment to breathe and think about how big God is. Maybe before you pray about something, you should do communion. Maybe before you pray, you should study the Bible. I told you my story when the doctor found a cyst on my vocal cords. 
I came to the prayer team where we have twice a month, first and third Sunday of the month before church, our prayer team meets in the prayer room in one of our, one of our classrooms for prayer. I asked permission if I could request uh, prayer. I went into that prayer room and told them about what the doctor said. I said, I don't want prayer today. I said, here are five Bible verses I'm reading and thinking about and meditating on. Five promises for healing. I would like you guys to read those with me. And I want to come back in two weeks and ask you to pray for me. And we did that. And I read those verses every day. Thought about them, meditated on them, thought through them. Came back and they prayed for me. Went back to the doctor, sis was gone. I like that. That was a good result. But I paused, I collected the promises, and then we prayed. So sometimes you just need to relax a little bit. I want to read to you from a verse that's already been on the screen, and that is 416. Romans 4, chapter 16, verse Chapter 4, verse 16 says this. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. And it says this, that the promise might be sure to all the seed. The way God made a system that is equality. The way God made the system that it's equal for everybody. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your tribe. It doesn't matter your sex. What's equal for everybody is faith. God made a system where here's a promise and you put faith in the promise and that gives you the ability and the power to have the change and for the prayer to get answered. I hope you learned something today. I hope you took some notes. I hope you realize that you have to, in order to have a promise work in your life or prayer to work in your life, you need a promise and that promise has the power of God to bring it to pass. Let me throw this out for you. You have no right to pray for something you don't have a promise for. Grace provides all the promises but you don't pray for things that God hasn't promised you. You need to find if God has promised you that. Has he promised that deliverance to you? Has he promised that thing to you? Is there, and if you can find it in the scripture, you have the legal right, the grace right, the authority from God himself to come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for that and ask for help. Faith works grace. Grace works the promise. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord